In this video, I'll be continuing my journey into programming assembly language for the Commodore 64. This time I'll be exploring an assembler package called Merlin 64. This software package was mentioned by a viewer in a comment left on a previous video I made, and I thought it would be fun to try and learn this assembler package. I find the best way for me to learn new languages and developer tools is to give myself a project and use the new tool to try to, to accomplish it. The project I came up with is translating the basic program called the Dancing Mouse, which is found on things like page 165 or 66 um, in the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide. It has sprites, animation, and sound, all just in a single printed page of basic code. As a uh, beginner student of 6510 Assembler, I think this will be a great project for me to further my knowledge in the language and uh, tools uh, available at the time. As a bonus, the output is not just Hello World, but a cute mouse tap dancing across the screen. So this should be a blast. Uh, the copy of the manual for the Merlin 64 assembly I found has a date of 1984 on it. So this kind of fits right into the time period that I find myself the most fascinated with as in regards to its developer tools and you know the hardware and software that was available. I just, I just love that time period. Uh, the environment I'm gonna use for this is a uh, Commodore 64 with two 1541 disk drives provided through uh, emulation, of course, using the wonderful Vice emulator. Um, I'm not going to be using Fastload Cartridge or Jiffy Joss to speed things up. Um, this emulated environment is pretty similar to what I had back in 1984 when I was a kid, uh, just dreaming of writing video games while reading Computes Gazette magazines like they were the latest issue of Spider-Man. <laughs> the feature in Vice that I love the most is the emulated disk drive sounds. It just it just brings you back to such a wonderful place in time that I just look so fondly of. Um, but because the nostalgia of the long loading times might get old pretty quick, I'm probably gonna be editing out some of the load times so I don't bore you all to tears. Well, before we get started, let's talk about uh, what exactly we're gonna do. So what you see here is a, the page that's the source code of the dancing mouse. Uh, and again, this is from the C64 programmer's reference, page 166. Uh, that, of course, is a book that um, I used and looked at a lot uh, as a child, just trying to learn how to program the Commodore. And that's, this was a program that just really uh, brought back good memories. So I thought it would be fun to try to create it in uh, an assembler. So I actually typed this into the computer for fun. And I know it's probably a different definition of fun that most of you have, but, uh, but I enjoyed it. Uh, and here is what the program does. Um, and it only took me about 10 minutes to key in. I have it on my second disk drive, so I'm gonna load it from comma nine. And there's the code uh, that I just typed in. And uh, here's what it does. All right, well, I think the best way to approach uh, translating this into assembler, and you can see the source code here, is to break it up into parts that we can build uh, one at a time. So here's the battle plan I came up with. Here I circled and assigned each of these sections of the basic source code to a put file. Uh, these are individual source code files that are injected or put into the main source file during assembly. So instead of having one giant listing of assembler code for the whole program, uh, we're going to have a set of source files where each file, for the most part, uh, has a single responsibility and should make the code uh, more easy to read and easier to bug. Let's get started. We're going to put uh, the Merlin disk into drive 8 and a blank disk into drive 9. All right, let's load up Merlin. All right, we're gonna be storing all of the source code and compiled output onto our blank floppy disk in drive nine. Drive eight will be used by Merlin itself, although I'm pretty sure once Merlin is loaded, it doesn't really look at the disk, but I could be wrong. In any case, it's fun to have an excuse to use two drives. Um, by pressing the C key from this menu, we can get a catalog or basically a directory listing of what's in a drive. And right now, as you can see, we're pointing at drive eight. 
And here we can see the contents of, of the uh, Merlin assembler package. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press D to change the drive and I'm gonna type nine and press enter. And now it is set to use drive nine. And of course, pressing C, we can see that we have our blank disk there. All right, and we're still at the menu prompt where we can do other commands, but we can just press enter to uh, repaint the screen. So the menu screen has a percent prompt. Anytime you see a percent prompt, the software is expecting a command from this menu screen. The manual refers to this as the executive module, but I'm probably just gonna call it the menu screen. Uh, but let's press E to enter the editor assembler. Uh, and we're just gonna add some lines of code and I'll talk about how the editor works as I go through this. Cool. As you can see, it's a line-based editor. It's quite a bit more strict than built-in basic editor. You can't move up or down with the arrow keys to edit previous lines. Uh, so to edit a line, you would use like the E command. So I'm just gonna change uh, line five by typing in E5. And I'm gonna change it to say, uh, end of PRG. And I'm gonna have it do a break. And then you can just press L to relist your program and you can see our change. The way that their code is uh, is built is it's very strictly a four column editor. So the first column is where you put labels. The second column is where your opcode and I'll call them pseudo opcodes go, like LDA, LDX, etc. The third column is your operands. And in the fourth column, which we haven't used yet, is where you put comments. And it is very strict. When I talked about pseudo operands, for example, ORG is not actually a you know, 6510 instruction. It just tells us where the start of our program is. Uh, I think it stands for or origination or something to that effect. Um, so let's assemble this. And you can just type in ASM, press enter. It's gonna ask you to update source. I'll talk about what that does in a few. So we're gonna choose end for now. And you can see that it assembled our code and it shows a complete listing of the assembled code at the top, shows you how it looks in memory, um, shows that it's seven bytes, gives us the symbol table, we only have one symbol, the end of program. And now we uh, want to, to run it. So to enter the monitor, you just type in MON, and now we're in a machine language monitor. The monitor has a dollar sign prompt. You can list uh, the, uh, or, or disassemble, if you will, the code that's actually in memory at 8,000 by typing in 8,000. L for list, and we can see our assembled code in memory. Here we can see the one, two, the three, four, and the five, six that I loaded values into, followed by our break command. So now let's run it. We'll just do an 8000G to run it. Uh, it runs, and because there's a break, it returns back to the monitor, and it shows you the current state of the, 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 the processor flags and registers. So we can see our one, two, three, four, five, six in the accumulator and X and Y registers. We can see the program counter is at 8,008, which is you know where our program ended, I guess. <laughs> and you can see the stack pointer and you can see um, the processor flags. Uh, for, for now, we're gonna return back to the editor. And to do that, you use the R key. And now we're back in the editor. So we're gonna list this code out and we're gonna make some changes to it. Uh, we're gonna delete lines two through four because they're not really useful for what we're doing for our program. And you use the D command and you do a from and through separated by comma. So now two through four are, go are gone. Okay. And now we're gonna insert some lines in front of line two. So you use I2 to do that. We're gonna load in the lowercase h We're gonna call the kernel routine to print it to the screen. And we're gonna list it again. So we can see that we've made those changes. Uh, we're gonna assemble and rerun this by using the ASM command again. And it worked. I'm gonna make another minor change I just remembered now. I'm gonna change that break to an RTS. So we're gonna edit four. Okay. 
Okay, we've assembled it, and then we're going to run it in the monitor to make sure it works correctly. And we can see that it printed uh, an, a, an H to the screen. So let's go back to the executor or the menu screen by pressing Q instead of R. So now we're back to the menu and we want to save this source code that we're working on. We're going to use the S command to save the source code. And we're just going to type in the word mouse. You'll notice that it added a dot S to the end of it uh, when it saved it. So if you press C for catalog, you could see it's mouse.s. Uh, and what's more interesting is that it has a PRG type. It's a program. It's not a sequential file. It's not text. So they have their own kind of condensed um, uh, source code format. So for now, we're going to go back to the menu by pressing the Enter key. And now we're going to output that assembled code to a binary file or to an object file. And we perform that with the O key. You'll see that it defaulted to the word mouse. So we can press Enter. And you could see that it added dot O to the end of it to signal that it's an object file. Using the C key for a catalog, you can see in mouse.o. This is actually runnable. So let's restart and run it to see it run on our Commodore. And here our program runs by printing uh, an H out. Uh, so let's get back into Merlin and continue our journey. All right, we're going to choose drive nine. So let's take a look at her battle plan again. What I'd like to do is work on the init screen put file. And what that's going to do is clear the screen and write, I am the dancing mouse in white, a few lines from the top of the screen. So let's go back into the editor. And let's key in all the init screen commands. Okay, so this does um, a few things. We created a, a block of memory called TX message, which has the characters that we want to send to the kernel to print out. So we have a clear screen, which is 147. We have five enter keys, which is 13. We have a five, which changes the color to white. Then we have the text, I am the dancing mouse. We turn the cursor back to the default light blue, and then we have a zero to signal that we are done writing a string. And the top part, of course, just uh, uses the X register to iterate through that, calling it to FFD2 um, to output the text. Then when it is done outputting the text, it moves to the bottom uh, of this uh, where it says TX end. You'll notice that there is no org in this file. This file is going to be injected into our mouse.s file. Uh, so we don't need to have that. So now we're going to run it through the assembler to make sure that it's structurally correct. And it is, which is great. So now we're going to quit and go back to the, um, the executor or the, the main menu. Now this time, instead of saving a source code, we're going to use the W command to write it to a text file. And we're going to call this init screen .put. Now we're going to load our mouse source code. Going to list it. We're going to insert line two. 
we're going to insert line to uh, the put for the for the file that we created. We're also going to delete lines three and four. Uh, and you can see now that our program starts at eight thousand. We're putting into that spot all the code that's in image screen that put, and then we end the program by RTSing. So we're going to assemble this now and see how it includes the init screen that put into our compile into our um, into our mouse.source code. I pause the output by pressing a space bar. What you could see is you could see the first line from our mouse source code, the org 8000. You could see it pulling in the init screen that put file and just compiling straight forward. And then you can see it coming back to our mouse.s where the end of program RTS is and it's finished assembling. Cool, so let's go back and save our new mouse source code by going back to the main menu of the queue. Uh, we're gonna do S to save. Now, this is an interesting part and uh, there, I guess there's some minor controversy to it. Normally, if you just press enter, you'll get an error that the file exists. All right. So you can save the source. But you can put an at colon in front of the file name, which will cause the disk drive to delete the file and then resave it. And that works pretty well. However, in their manual, they kind of warn you not to use that. So here you can see in the, uh, the section I highlighted, uh, caution, occasional serious disk problems may result from using the at colon syntax, and this is presumably due to a bug in the Commodore uh, operating systems. Thus, unless you have adequate backups for your files, it is suggested that this should be avoided and instead scratch before resaving. Well, we're in an emulator, so who cares? We're just going to use the at colon. We're going to be just fine. But fair warning, that's there, and I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, uh, thing to note. And let's go back to the editor for one moment. I want to talk briefly about the update source question when you run ASM. If you choose Y, nothing happens. Turns out if you put a slash anywhere in any of the columns in your source code, it'll stop the assembler, make you fix it before it continues. So for example, I'll put a slash on a second line of code. So now when I run ASM, and I say update source, it puts me here, and presumably I would do something, like clean it up, I suppose, and then it would continue. I'm sure there's a really good use case for it. I don't really know what it is, so it's not for me, but kind of an interesting feature. Uh, so I think we were off to a good start. We covered the real basics of the Merlin assembler package. We kind of got our basic, basic structure of how we're gonna uh, build this project. And in the next video, I'm going to continue with the project by uh, translating the init sound and load sprite data sections, as you, as you can see in our battle plan here, and, and maybe more. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I hope to see you there. Thank you so much for watching.